On the Duty of Civil Disobedience by Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau begins by presenting perhaps his most famous quote, namely, that the government is best which governs least. It expands that a bit to claim the government is best which governs not at all. Now he regards government to be an expedient and claims that governments are usually inexpedient. And he has a fairly negative view of this, namely he takes the view that the government, the mode the people have chosen to execute their will, is able to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. And so the view he takes is that we should have less and better government. Why? Well, he claims the government show how people can impose upon themselves and in something that will, if you're familiar with the, the Tea Party movement uh, today and the conservative view about the government, it'll sound familiar. Namely, his view is the government never furthered any enterprise except by getting out of its way. So his view is basically government should stay out of business. Also, he takes government to be an expedient and the way to succeed in this regard is to let one another alone. So he's presenting a view that would be regarded as libertarianism today, or more extremely in terms of getting rid of government, would be anarchism. But his general view is less government is better. And he presents, again, two stock arguments. One interferes with business and enterprise, and second interferes with people's freedom. And so he sees government as being problematic. Now, he also goes against and criticizes majority rule. Now, he's not advocating you know, tyranny. He's not going that way. He's basically advocating not having rule. So what's the problem as he sees it with majority rule? This is what he claims. If there's power in the hands of the people, a majority is printed to rule, not because they're most likely to be correct, or this is fairest to the minority. It is because they are simply the strongest. And he claims that a government in which the majority rules in all cases cannot be based on justice. So interestingly enough, he's critical of a major foundation of what we regard as modern democracy, namely majority rule. Now, he also focuses, given his view that this is you know, civil disobedience, on the nature of obedience. It begins by looking at conscience. Now he raises the question, must the citizen resign his conscience to the legislator? And he asks the rhetorical question, why then does each person have a conscience and claims we should be men first and subjects afterwards? Now, in regards to the law, his view is, is that we should cultivate a respect not for the law, but for what is right. And he claims the only obligation people have a right to assume is to do what they think is right. And he claims that, rather, which would seem kind of unusual, that law never made people more just, and the respect for it makes them agents of injustice. Now, of course, at first, that might seem like a paradox or a contradiction, that law doesn't make people just, and the respect for it makes them agents of injustice. Because normally we think of the law as being justice, and people respecting it as being just. But what he seems to have in mind is, you know, the war against Mexico, slavery, etc. And he believes that people will simply obeying the law because it's the law in such cases would make them agents of injustice. But if people follow what is right, as opposed to what is merely legal, they'll be acting justly. And so he presents the clear foundation for his view, namely, one should follow morality and ethics rather than merely the law. Now, in terms of those who obey the law, he first looks at the military and police, and he notes, you know, are soldiers, men, or simply small, movable forts in the service of some unscrupulous man in power? And he claims most people serve the state not as people, but as machines, simply providing the physical power behind them. In the case of office holders, such as legislators, politicians, lawyers, ministers, etc., they serve the state with their heads, but he claims they rarely make moral distinctions and is likely to serve the devil without intending it as God. And a very few who he regards as heroes serve the state with their conscience. So, he believes, they necessarily resist it for the most part and are commonly treated as enemies of the state. Now, 
In regards to revolution and submission, he claims, incorrectly obviously, that all will recognize the right of revolution. This is the right to refuse allegiance to and also to resist the government when its tyranny or inefficiency are great and unendurable. So it provides two grounds for resisting government authority. The first is on the basis of tyranny. And interestingly enough, he also includes inefficiency. So if the government becomes too tyrannical, it may be justly resisted. If it becomes too inefficient, it may also be justly resisted. Now he draws an analogy between the state and a machine, which of course is you know, a common metaphor or analogy made when you talk about the state or government. And he notes that you know, he doesn't expect the state to be perfect, because he says that all machines have their friction. And this might, you know, in the case of the state, might balance out more good than evil. But in continuing the metaphor, when the friction has its machine, an impression of robbery organized, let us not have the machine. Now he considers an opposing viewpoint to his own, put forth by, by Paley in his essay, Duty of Submission to Civil Government. Now Paley resolves all civil obligation into expediency, and essentially is presenting what could be regarded as a utilitarian approach. And Paley contends that as long as the government cannot be resisted or changed without public inconvenience, it is the will of God that it be obeyed. So basically what he says what should be done is essentially an appeal to consequences, that one should consider, you know, the danger and grievance on one side, the probability and expense of redress on the other, and his view basically is if the resistance or change, you know, costs more to the public, then even if the thing is regarded as, you know, bad or unjust, then it should simply be accepted presumably on consequentialist grounds. Now, Thoreau rejects this. He claims, essentially, that Paley did not consider cases in which the rule of expediency does not apply, in which justice must be done regardless of cost. So going back to our moral methods, we can see Paley is presenting a consequentialist approach. Basically, you weigh the harms and benefits and assess the situation that way. Whereas Thoreau seems to be presenting sort of a rule-based approach, namely that you know, it's not the consequences that matter, it's that one must do what is right, regardless of the consequences. And according to you know, Thoreau, that's how we should act, doing what is correct, as opposed to considering and weighing, you know, the possible you know, pluses and minuses. The next thing he turns to, interestingly boringly enough, is the matter of voting. Now, we've seen that Thoreau has criticized government, he's criticized majority rule, he's criticized the beating of the law, and now he turns to criticizing voting, which of course is presented as, you know, not by him, but in general is presented as, you know, a fundamental foundation of democracy. And of course, we're urged by PSAs, etc., to vote. Now, as Thoreau sees it, for the most part, people generally don't do much in regards to what is good. Although, you know, people generally, as he sees it, think it's not important that many should be good, but there should be some good people. And, of course, as he notes, there are lots of people who oppose things they regard as wrong, in his case, slavery and war, but do nothing. They hesitate, regret, petition, but don't do anything in earnest or with effort. And they wait for others to, you know, solve the problem. And at most, they give up a cheap vote. So what's his criticism of voting? Well, it goes like this. He claims voting is essentially gambling and involves, you know, betting, naturally. And here it says he sees the problem. If someone goes and casts their ballot, they're essentially saying, you know, in a kind of a feeble way, that they want their side to prevail. But they're also essentially saying, but if my side's not in the majority, oh well, essentially, that I'll go with whatever side has the most people. And so if by chance I win because more people vote my way, then hooray. If not, because more people vote the other way, then I guess, you know, I've lost. And so Thoreau sees that as problematic because if people simply rely on voting, 
the right is not always going to, in terms of the moral right, is not always going to be successful. So regards voting is mere gambling. So what people, what should they do then? Well, he begins with a pretty sort of heavy duty requirement. He claims it is a man's duty to vote himself to the eradication of any wrong, which of course is pretty extreme. And as we saw back in the ancient days of part two, I noted that you know, moral theory or moral standards needs to be practical. It needs to be such that an average person could at least live up to the basic standards. And so Thoreau, not surprisingly, kind of backs it off a bit. He does say that people may properly have other concerns, then he kind of backs it up a bit more, that a person should at least wash his hands of it and not give it his support. And at the very least, he says, you know, it must not at least be actively involved in it. So he kind of begins with, we're going to eradicate all the wrongs. But then he says, well, at the very least, you shouldn't support them. So he claims. Now he does note, interestingly or boringly enough, that the support of government, you know, the support of mistakes, etc., require the most disinterested virtues to sustain it. In other words, the people who disapprove of the government, while at the same time giving it allegiance and support, are, sort of ironically, its most conscientious supporters, and often the most serious obstacles to reform, or so he claims. So what does he think should be done? Well, here's view is, is that people should take action. Now, he draws an analogy, or presents an example. He says, suppose a person you know is cheated of a single dollar by their neighbor. Now, the person is not satisfied with knowing they're cheated, or saying they're cheated, or simply with, you know, putting together like a petition for the person to pay. The person takes steps to get their money back and to avoid being cheated again. And so his view is, is that people, when it comes to things that are wrong, they should take at least as much effort as they take to, you know, reclaim their dollar, namely, take action. Now, he believes that there are unjust laws, even today, or even during his time, which, of course, raises the interesting question, what about today? Are there unjust laws still today? And, of course, people certainly think so. For example, people who support same-sex marriage believe the laws that prevent it are unjust. People who are against same-sex marriage believe that the laws that allow it are unjust. People who are morally opposed to abortion believe the laws that allow it are unjust. People that believe that abortion is at least morally tolerable believe the laws are just. And so even now we have laws that people regard as just or unjust. Now, Thoreau takes the view that most people think that when there are unjust laws, we should just wait for the majority to, you know, come around to change them. And on the basis that resisting, you know, this would be worse than the evil being done. And Thoreau thinks that the reason why the remedy would be worse would be because of the government. So what does he think people should do? What sort of thing should people do? Well, he doesn't advocate violence, so he's against violence. And he claims that when resisting injustice, he says the state, uh, well, getting you know, to the point of the state, he claims that the state is kind of an odd system of punishment, namely that the government really hasn't worked out, you know, the proportional punishment for disobeying or denying the state, like refusing to pay taxes. Now he says if someone doesn't pay taxes, they're, you know, imprisoned indefinitely, or so he claims. But if someone steals from the state, they don't they're not punished as severely, or so he claims. Now getting back to the main point, what then should people do? Well his claim is is that if the law is unjust, people should break that law. And they should become, you know, agents of justice as opposed to agents of injustice. And going back to his machine analogy, his view is, is that maybe injustice is a necessary part of the friction of government. You know, perhaps it'll wear smooth eventually. But if the injustice has a part exclusively for itself, then what a person should do, if they're required to be agents of this injustice, then they should refuse to go along, to break the law. 
going with machine analogy or metaphor to be a counterfriction to stop the machine. And as he sees it, a person has to, to see to it that they do not lend themselves to a wrong they condemn. In other words, by failing to propose it, they would be supporting it. Which, of course, in a way was kind of echoed in the 1960s by the saying, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Now, Thoreau, of course, was locked up you know, for one night. And he does consider, you know, the role of prison in this regard. And he claims, kind of dramatically, if the government is unjust and imprisons people unjustly, the place for the just person is in prison. Now, of course, there are a couple of concerns about, you know, being in prison. Um, one of which, of course, from the standpoint of resisting the government and bringing about change, would be a loss of influence. So the person's in jail and their influence would be lost. Now, Thoreau claims this is not the case. They would be like an enemy within its walls. Now, in some cases, this has turned out to be correct. I mean, most famously, you can think of uh, Nelson Mandela, imprisoned in South Africa for opposing apartheid, and of course, was well known. And so, eventually, you know, he succeeded, was released, and became president. So, went from prisoner to president. And so, in some cases, this does does work. But of course, it's worth noting there are other cases where people simply vanish into prisons if they're not famous or perhaps even if they are, and are never heard from again. Now, he also believes that going to prison would be a useful thing in this regard, because he claims that a person who's experienced the injustice can more eloquently and effectively combat it. Now, but his view, again, is, is a peaceful revolution, namely not acting violently. But his view is basically the way it works is this. If a person opposes something morally, in the case that he's considering, you know, the war in Mexico and slavery, that if the minority simply conforms to the majority, simply goes by the vote, then the majority will always win. But if the minority of people who oppose these wrong things clog by its whole weight, in other words, they break the law and they go to prison and, you know, they don't pay their taxes, and the, collect, the tax gatherer resigns, etc. Thoreau's view is this will bring about the change he wants. Now, as I mentioned in the background, in his own day he was not particularly well known, and you know he believed that this method would put an end to war and slavery, uh, but obviously did not. And so his method suggest, that he suggested was not implemented then and did not succeed. But of course, later on, as we saw in India, and then in the United States, and the Civil Rights Movement ended up being successful. Next, we'll pick up on part two of Thoreau, looking at property and protection.